Thanks for taking the time to be here again, and as always, hopefully, all of you will find this video edifying. There was something that Father Carlos Martins shared in one of his homilies before that really resonated within me. I remember taking care of someone before who had later passed away, but I still remember that I didn't really mind taking care of him. And even though in his final few weeks he was unable to say a word anymore, I still didn't mind taking care of him. He was my grandfather. Anyway, although not exactly the same, here Father Martin shared the story of a father who looked after his daughter. Years ago, I met a man who had lost his daughter. She died at approximately the age of 17 years old. Uh, she had been born severely handicapped, uh, so she was bedridden, uh, she needed, uh, she could not speak, uh, she was blind, and she was deaf. Uh, and so with all of these physical handicaps, her life would have been an experience very different than what we have. And among the needs, she, she needed to have all of her needs taken care of, including uh, when she would uh, excrete bodily waste, she had to have a diaper on, and the diaper would collect that waste, and so she needed her diaper changed several times a day. And so when, when she passed, when she died, there was the, the, it hit her father very hard, hit her mother very hard. But I remember being with her father and uh, he was, this was about six months after her passing, it had hit him on that day particularly hard. And he was reminiscing out loud that in the course of his life, he had changed her diaper some 15,000 times, 15,000 times. And he remarked how it was never a burden, that he never found that task a burden. And he had wished even in that moment that she was alive so that he could change her diaper even just one more time. That was the love that he had for his daughter. That even a task that would be as menial as that would be was a task that, because of his love for her, was very meaningful. The commandments of the Lord are not burdensome, for whoever is begotten by God conquers the world. The resurrection of the Lord has brought the Lord's Spirit within us. We share Jesus' Holy Spirit. And because we share His Spirit, that is why we are members of the body of Jesus. We, we are limbs, we are body parts, each one of us individually, on that body of Christ. And that image is difficult for us to visualize. We're, we're, as humans, we're visual creatures. Uh, so we, we hear those words, but it often doesn't sink into us that we are members of his body. Well, how on earth can we be members of, of, of Jesus's body? Well, we, we each have our own separate bodies. How, do, how does that work? It is the spirit that unites a body. Right? It, is a, it is the spirit. And so in our own uh, beings, our spirit, our soul, is what causes our own body parts to function as one whole. And, and the proof of this is, if somehow, God forbid, if, if one of our body parts are severed, if an arm is severed off a body, it is no longer sharing in the spirit of the body. Right? And the proof of this is, wait two weeks. Right? The arm doesn't look like an arm anymore. And it's for this reason, even the ancient philosopher Aristotle, who lived 2,500 years ago, uh, he said a, a limb severed off the body is no longer a limb. Right? An arm that is severed off a human body is no longer an arm. The proof of it is just keep waiting and keep checking back on that arm. It begins to look less and less like an arm because it's no longer fed by the spirit. It's no longer fed the nutrients uh, that, that the body provides it with, true. But more than that, it's no longer connected to the spirit of the body. And so it begins to disintegrate. 
and eventually after time it returns to dust it returns to the dust of the earth we are members of christ's body if we share his spirit and that spirit that raised jesus from the dead is what raises us from the dead as well it will raise us from the dead and those you know when when we literally leave this earth when our souls are separated from our body but he raises us from the dead now by forgiving our sins and by empowering us with extraordinary power he, the holy spirit imparts to us the victory of the victory of christ in astounding ways and now for the second part of this video just like before, we'd like to talk about one of the saints in the church. Blessed Marie Anne was born on April 18, 1809, in a family of deeply Christian farmers. From her mother, she inherited a piety centered on divine providence and the Eucharist, and from her father, a deep faith and a strong patience in suffering. Mary Ann and her family were victims of illiteracy, so common in French-Canadian milieu of the 19th century. Still an illiterate at the age of 22, Marie Ann worked as a domestic in the convent of the Sisters of the Congregation of Notre Dame that had been recently opened in her own village. A year later, she registered as a boarder in order to learn to read and write. She then became a novice in the congregation, but had to leave due to ill health. In 1833, she became a teacher in the parochial school. Little by little, she found out that one of the causes of this illiteracy was due to a certain church ruling that forbade that girls be taught by men and that boys be taught by women. Unable to finance two schools, many parish priests chose to have none. In 1848, under an irresistible call of the Spirit, Marie Anne presented to her bishop a plan she long cherished that of founding a religious congregation for the education of poor country children, both girls and boys, in the same schools. A rather new project for the time. It even seemed quite rash and contrary to the established order. Since the state was in favor of such schools, Bishop Bourget authorized a modest attempt so as to avoid a greater evil. The Congregation of the Sisters of St. Anne was founded on September 8, 1850. Marie Anne, now named Mother Marie Anne, became its first superior. The rapid growth of this young community soon required larger quarters. During the summer of 1853, Bishop Bourget transferred the mother house to Saint-Jacques de Lachigan. The new chaplain, Father Louis Adolphe Marachal, interfered in an abusive way in the private life of the community. During the foundress's absence, Father changed the pupil's boarding fees. Should he be away for a while, he asked that the sisters await his return to go to confession. After a year of this existing conflict between the chaplain and the foundress, the latter being anxious to protect the rights of her community, Bishop Bourget asked Mother Marie Anne on August 18, 1854, to resign. He called for elections and warned Mother Marie Anne not to accept the superiorship even if her sisters wanted to re-elect her. Even though she could be re-elected, according to the rule of the community, Mother Marie Anne obeyed her bishop, whom she considered God's instrument. And she wrote, As for me, my lord, I bless divine providence a thousand times for the maternal care she shows me in making me walk the way of tribulations and crosses. Mother Marie Anne, having been named directress at St. Genevieve Convent, became the target of attacks from the mother house authorities, influenced by the dictatorship of Father Marachal. Under the pretext of poor administration, Mother Marie Anne was recalled to the Mother House in 1858, with the bishop's warning, take means so that she will not be a nuisance to anyone. From this new destitution, and until her death on January 2nd, 1890, Mother Marie Anne was kept away from administrative responsibilities. She was even kept away from the general council deliberations when the 1872 and 1878 elections re-elected her. Assigned to mostly hidden work in the laundry and ironing room, she led a life of total self-denial and thus ensured the growth of the congregation. Behold the paradox of an influence which some wanted to nullify. In the Mother House basement laundry room in Lachine, where she spent her days, 
many generations of novices received from the foundress a true example of obedience and humility imbued with authentic relationships which ensure true fraternal charity to a novice who asked her one day why she the foundress was kept aside in such lowly work she simply replied with kindness the deeper a tree sinks its roots into the soil the greater are its chances of growing and producing fruit the attitude of mother marie anne who was a victim of so many injustices allows us to bring out the evangelical sense she gave to events in her life just as jesus christ who passionately worked for the glory of his father so too mother marie anne sought only god's glory in all she did the greater glory of god was the aim she herself gave her community to make god known to the young who have not the happiness of knowing him was for her a privileged way of working for the glory of god deprived of her most legitimate rights and robbed of all her personal letters with her bishop she offered no resistance and she expected from the infinite goodness of god the solution to the matter she was convinced that he will know well in his wisdom how to discern the false from the true and to reward each one according to his deeds prevented from being called mother by those in authority mother marie anne did not jealously hold on to her title of foundress rather she chose annihilation just like jesus her crucified love so that her community might live however she did not renounce her mission of spiritual mother of her community she offered herself to god in order to expiate all the sins which were committed in the community and she daily prayed saint anne to bestow on her spiritual daughters the virtues so necessary for christian educators like any prophet invested with a mission of salvation mother marie anne lived persecution by forgiving without restriction convinced that there is more happiness in forgiving than in revenge this evangelical forgiveness guarantee of the peace of soul which she held most precious was ultimately proven on her deathbed when she asked her superior to call for father marichal for the edification of the sisters as she felt the end approaching mother marie anne left to her daughters her spiritual testament in these words which are a resume of her whole life may holy eucharist and perfect abandonment to god's will be your heaven on earth she then peacefully passed away at the mother house of lachine on january 2nd 1890 happy to go to the good god she had served all her life Well then, that will be all for the video this time. And as always, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us. And hopefully, all of you have learned a lot from this video. Remember, if there's any feedback or suggestion, please let us know in the comments below. And until the next one, thanks again for watching and may God bless you.